Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. We are changing the way we buy our groceries. We can go to the local supermarket, the Internet, or the local gas station even. What's that doing to the generation's old staple of the grocery business, the mom-and-pop neighborhood grocery store? That's our subject in this segment. Joining me in studio are Vincent Robotka. He runs the family's 106-year-old Vincent's Market. Maddie Ernest is co-owner of Local Harvest Grocery. It almost went out of business a couple of years ago. And Chris Goodson is the owner of Fields Foods. Only one store now, but more are planned. Thank you all so much for being with us. Great to have you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Right. I'm going to ask each of you the same question to start. Maddie, I'll start with you. What is it about your establishment you think that sets you apart from all the others? Well, we love to talk about that. Yeah. Um, Definitely what we're what kind of sets us apart is we have a mission based store. So we were founded to be a place where people could come and buy products that were from local farmers and food producers. So in the very beginning, we really um, highlighted a certain mileage marker even for where the foods were coming from. All righty. And what kind of pressure do you get from the big boys, the, you know, the big, the major supermarkets? <laughs> the major supermarkets. Yeah. You know, what's funny, I was thinking of this yesterday. I, you know, I think we have a lot of the staples that people can get at the larger stores, um, but we also have a, maybe a somewhat different competitor, and that might be more like a farmer's market. Um, but definitely we have people who choose us over larger stores because they can get most of what they want. Vince, what sets you apart from the uh, the big boys, the big players? Well, we uh, really um, – um, to our meat department, we really highlight. But in the store, we do carry a whole variety of product. Anywhere in the summer, in the wintertime, somebody comes in looking for parchment paper, we carry it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's – and we have a good selection of wine, beer, and uh, we carry all the staples that you could – do every your everyday shopping there. And Chris, I, I guess we would have to identify you as sort of an intermediate between the major players, let's say, if we concede that Schnooks and Deerbergs probably are the big players in sure. Charlotte. No. You're, you're in between the other two that we're talking with here and those those folks. Yeah, Dan, I guess that's a fair description. And, and our concept is what I call a third, a third, a third. We have a third uh, organic product, uh, the healthy eating. And just like Maddie and Vince, we have a third roughly so local product from local farmers, uh, but given that we're not in Northern California or mm-hmm. or Oregon, uh, you can still get your Ted Drews and your toasted Ravs and your Diet Coke. Mm-hmm. And uh, the final components, like to sprinkle a little fun on there, you can drink wine or craft beer while you shop. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of you know taking the the best of all the different concepts and, and melding them together. Well, you're planning some expansion to uh, downtown and also to Dogtown. Obviously, you did your due diligence before m- making plans to expand. What were you seeing? Is it gee, there's there's an opportunity here. Sure. No, and, and really it follows our mission to go into areas that are food deserts and take them from being food deserts and make them former food deserts. I know that sounds cute, but what I mean by that is that I can't literally go out in the middle of the desert and sell, uh, sell food. We'd be out of business in three days. But you want to go to neighborhoods that are growing and coming. But at the same time, just as you talked about earlier in the lead-in, I don't want to go head-on-head head against Schnooks and Deerbergs. You know, mm-hmm. those guys are established and large uh, operators. But it's to go into neighborhoods in the city and the urban core that are growing and be part of that neighborhood, just like Vince and Maddie are in their neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dogtown and uh, Downtown West are, are heading in that right direction. Mm-hmm. Vince, how has Vincent's market managed to hang around for 106 years? Well, it's been a family business, and uh, my grandfather started the business as a meat market at 13th and Nimitz, which it was in Soulard till the highway took it. And uh, we've, we've, I enjoy what I do. And this, and this, and, and uh, my two sons work for me full time, and I got a third son that also comes in. And we try to communicate with our customers and get, supply them with their needs. If they need something special, and if we can get it, we will, we will do it. We also do some. Uh, distributing to like the Pink Sisters up in North St. Louis. We supply them with some product. And then our other big uh, item besides meat is our our keg list. Being in Soulard in Mardi Gras, 
we were the the go to place for the house parties during Mardi, during Mardi Gras. And after the Mardi Gras was over, people still kept calling us back, and so we get people from all over the city and county, and even from some place in northern part of uh, Illinois, come in and buy uh, kegs of beer and take them home. That's a little bit different, I think, than what many people might think, that an establishment like yours would be a place that people would stop by and pick up a couple of things they forgot at Schnucks. Well, we get some customers that shop every day, but I think on the average they come in maybe three to five times a a week and they use us for a fill-in, but then we also have our regular customers that do their weekly shopping there. Yeah. Are you going to be there for another 106 years? Well, I don't think I will be. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a, uh, my family, my son's working for me right now, and if they want to continue the business, it's all good for them. Yeah. Maddie, uh, your your place has, has had some difficulties in past yes. years, mm-hmm. and I think it's really quite a story and a, quite a testimony to not only uh, you and, and yours, but to the uh, your customers. They, they really came through for you. They really did. I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that's painful to go back and relive, but also with the pain is a lot of good memories of customer support and community. And definitely, you know, when we started the store, the idea of it was to support, if you will, the, the region, the community by buying from local farmers, local producers. Mm-hmm. And I think the community responded to that mission and responded to us being in that area and, and wanting a store there. And, yeah, they we really have some of the greatest customers, for sure. Well, just, just explain briefly what they what they did to pull you through this. So we, uh, because of some expansions that didn't go well, um, we were in a state of going to shut down pretty likely unless we raised a certain amount of money. And we put it out. Really, I did not think we would meet the goal. Um, and we did very quickly. Uh, we did a perk with it. So, But we asked our customers to wait a year um, once they bought in to wait one year to redeem those so we could have some recovery time. Uh, we also had a partner come in at that time, another financial partner that helped. And so with that, and he was actually someone who we already knew, together those two things really pulled us through that and some wonderful staff and managers who decided to stick with us too. And, yeah, we were able to redeem as many of those certificates as people wanted. There were certainly some who were like, don't give us a perk. We just want you to stick around. And so, yeah. So And so you did. Mm-hmm. And it's that customer loyalty is has to be huge for people like yourself. Customer well, loyalty. Well, we got a, cu- lot of, a lot of customers with loyalty. And the people uh, have ha- A, B, and B uh, rent out their houses or something like that. And they recommend us to the to the owners recommend us, and they then the feedback we get from them that says the people come in, they just are astounded. They just think the store is so unique, and takes them back into maybe a time when they were, you know, many many small neighborhood stores. Well, there are many people alive today who have no recollection of places like that, and they used to be omnipresent. They used to be mm-hmm. almost on every corner. No, they were on a, every corner because people didn't have a car to drive, and they'd come home from work and they'd stop at the corner store on the way, way home. Now, Chris, it seems to be going somewhat in a different direction because now I can order what I want from Amazon. Walmart, as I understand it, is getting ready to get into the, the mail order business. This is going to have an impact on you. Well, it, it does, but you know what? And I'm sure Maddie and Vince will say the same thing. People still like to come and touch their touch and feel their produce yeah. and talk to their to their meat guy and their meat gal and see what kind of meat they want and cuts mm-hmm. they want. Now, that doesn't mean you, you ignore technology. You want to have the apps because everybody has a phone, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody has that. So you want to have that technology for, for customer surveys and for what they like and what they dislike. But I, I don't see, you know, I don't see the delivery system here. I still see a loyalty from our neighborhoods, you know. And just kind of I'd like to add on, down what they were talking sure. about. You know, customer loyalty and mom-and-pop shops like all three of us here are how you bring this great city back. And what I mean by that is got to get those risk takers in, the residents first, that come in and repopulate these areas. But then you have to have risk takers. Just listen to Maddie here. you got to have risk takers like her and like Vince and like mm-hmm. myself that are willing to come in and cater those residents that took the first risk, and that will bring in the next wave. 
and that will bring in the third wave. Mm -hmm. And that's how you make an area that wasn't dense before or was a food desert, and you make it so dense that it explodes and pollinates the north side and the south side. So mm -hmm. I think in our own little way, we're, we're doing our own little part to try to rebuild the city. Uh, Vince, do you see yourself uh, as uh, and your market as sort of an anchor in the neighborhood, as Chris was just uh, just suggesting that it's an important part of keeping a neighborhood vibrant? Well, a lot of the residents in Soulard call Soulard an island, and they try to do all their shopping on the island. And we do feel like we are an uh, anchor. And 33 years ago when I moved back to Soulard, it was a desert, a food desert. It was the we upgraded the, our the meat. We upgraded the appearance of the store, and people are still coming. Obviously, Maddie, how about you? Do you feel that uh, that local harvest is an anchor in the community? I do. It, you know, we have people come in pretty regularly that will say, "Oh, you know, your store was a factor in us choosing this area." Or we wanted to move here. They like having that amenity. And we're not the only amenity in the area, but it is great for people to have that. So, you know, I talked about we cater definitely to people who have certain, um, you know, desire to support local. But there's also a convenience factor as well. You need some eggs. You need some milk, butter. You can pop in. You don't have to walk far. <laughs> you can park right there and go in. Yeah. Well, that's it. Did, go ahead, Chris. Well, no, I was just I was laughing because uh, I want to be able to charge a fee to all the real estate agents that come in our store because they're showcasing the area. Because mm -hmm. exactly your point, Maddie, yeah. they, they say, you know, hey, now you, this is what you can have in the amenities when you come move here or rent an apartment. So mm -hmm. you become almost like a, a welcome wagon for the neighborhoods. And, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, and that's kind of what I see in Dogtown and, and Downtown West, too. You're going to be an anchor, especially in those two new buildings. There's 168 people, apartments above the downtown west and 120 plus in Dogtown. And literally it's going to be come down the elevator and shop in the store, shop in your pajamas. So it really will be an anchor. Well, that sounds like a very convenient way to right. shop to yeah. me. We have to take a break now, but before we do, I'd like to uh, ask members of our listening audience to get into the conversation. If you like, we'd like to hear what your thoughts are about the local, the family grocery stores, the neighborhood grocery stores. Is that the way you shop, or do you prefer the, the, the big box stores, if you will? Give us a call, 382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Send an email to talk at stlpublicradio.org, or if you prefer to send a tweet, do so at STL on air. Back in a bit, this is St. Louis on the air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7, KWMU. Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast supported by University College at Washington University with undergraduate and graduate programs part-time evening and online. University College at Washington University offering world-class education within reach. Now back to that conversation about local grocery stores with Vincent Ramatka, Vincent's Market. It's in Soulard. Maddie Ernest, co-owner of Local Harvest Grocery. That, of course, is in the Tower Grove neighborhood. And Chris Goodson is the owner of Fields Foods, located currently in Lafayette Square, but soon to be growing. Okay, back to the uh, conversation. You had mentioned, Maddie, early on that there was uh, some competition from the local farmers' markets. Mm -hmm. how, how serious uh, is that competition? I don't really consider it that it's a uh, one or the other. We like to think that we can work together. And, in fact, uh, Patrick Horan, who's one of the owners as well, is the person who started the Tower Grove Farmers Market and has helped that expansion and grow it. So we consider they go together. But, yes, certainly a lot of the customers at the market are similar customers at our store. So mm -hmm. we try to create a synergy between those two. And, and Vince, uh, do you feel any sense of competition from these markets? Oh, well, Soulard Market uh, has been right around there. For, forever, and we're pretty close mm -hmm. to Soulard Market. And, and on, on Saturdays, uh, we put out a message board, and people drive by on their way to Soulard Market and says, well, we stopped in because we saw your special outside. You know, so it's a, a draw for some other people to come into the store. How about Fields? They use local produce? Uh, we do, mm -hmm. and, and we actually uh, tell people that Soulard's Market's down there. I mean, that's an iconic landmark, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, the best way to get that back on its feet is to have, you know, places like the Grove and Soulard and Lafayette Square continue to grow so people can go all over the place. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually promote it. I mean, that's an iconic landmark. 
Yeah. Well, let's take a call. We have Margaret calling from Kirkwood. She wants to get into the discussion, so let's bring her in. Go ahead, Margaret. Thank you for hearing me. I wanted to talk about a problem we had with a big box store purchase. You tend to buy more things than you can actually use. And to illustrate that point, we had um, bugs in our house. We couldn't figure out where they were coming from. It turns out they were coming from a big box of dog biscuits that we bought, thinking that we'd eventually use them. And we had just neglected them for too long, and the bugs had moved in. Yuck. Whereas when you shop at a local market, especially if you walk there, you don't buy way too much than you could ever use. Margaret, thanks for the call. Chris, uh, I don't think you like the sound of that uh, potential. Oh, no, not the yeah. bug. I don't think the bugs came with the, yeah. uh, the right. bag. But, no, she met, Margaret makes a good point. I mean, you buy too much at some of these big, you know, I, I don't want to use the word, but, you know, the Sam's or the places like that that have their purpose. But, you know, you can't use all that. Well, with our markets, you have the smaller things that you can get or the one-off items. Now, from a businessman and a businesswoman's perspective, that is a challenge because that costs more for us to carry, you know, in the economics. But we like to provide those products to our customers. So something might not move as much, but it's always there for you to get if you get that on that Tuesday of the week. Well, that cost issue is one that uh, certainly has to be a factor in all of this. Vincent, you know, the, the, the big players can buy in volume and thereby, thereby uh, probably at a lower cost. How do you compete against that? Well, a lot of the items, uh, big boys get a good discount on it, and they sell it at a loss leader. Where some of the items we can't ma- match that price because of our cost and our overhead. So, but we do do on our in our meat department, which like we can be very very competitive, and we beat them almost every day. Why is that? I mean, why would you be more competitive in meat? Well, because they have a bigger markup on it, and the supply, the, our cost is pretty close to what their cost is on meat products uh, right. over dry goods. And How about the pricing with you, Maddie? I mean, that has to be an issue. Oh, it's definitely been an issue, and, you know, it's a challenge for us. We try to just think for a lot of our customers, it's convenience to be able to come in quickly, get products. Um, and for many of our customers, they kind of have a similar uh, value system of wanting to support local, support their neighborhood, and they're willing to incur a little. And often it's really not that much, but a little bit additional cost for some of the items they want, especially, you know, when you're looking at organic products, which we do house, you know, or host quite a few organic products that are now being sold at a lot of other stores. So it gets tricky. Yeah, none Chris, of us. None of us are going to be able to compete with the WalMarts or the Targets of the world. I mean, it's just not going to happen. They're going to be able to undercut on the prices, but uh, people like the convenience, and they actually do the math in their head. By the time they drive all the way to Target to Walmart, mm-hmm. the gas and the mileage you put on there, plus their time is worth money. Mm-hmm. But it, to Maddie's point, to Vince's point too, that. They like the specialty items, so we carry those for them. And then all three of us try to make it fun atmosphere in those stores. Again, not to bash the big boys, but it's not very fun to go into a Walmart or Target, but it's fun to go in all three of our stores. We try to make it a friendly, fun atmosphere where you know the people there and you can talk to them about their kids and things like that. Let's uh, hear from Madonna in Crestwood who wrote in an email that she shops at Urban Harvest a group of rooftop farms downtown that grow fresh produce produce in the food desert north of St. Louis. She asks, pardon me, what role could small family-owned grocery stores play in solving the issues of food deserts? You alluded to that a little while ago, Chris, but Vincent, what do you think? We've uh, looked at locations in the city and even uh, in Belleville area over the years, and at the time we thought thought there were maybe too much of a food desert to make make a go of it. And we didn't have the the enough uh, capital to uh, ride the, uh, the until we would make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maddie, how about uh, how about your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's tricky. There was a store that opened in North City that had a very similar model to Local Harvest, and they weren't able to succeed. I think there's another one that's coming. Uh, and looking at opening in the North City area, kind of near Crown Candy area where there's been some development. Uh, So I definitely think that that's being addressed in some other ways by some other businesses. There's also the Metro Market, which has been going around to different locations and trying to get produce into those areas. The 
the thing that's hard, and I'm sure you all can attest to this too, is is loss. Um, right. And grocery stores, and this is some of the reason that <clears throat> some of the convenience stores are stores located in neighborhoods that are considered food deserts. It's hard for them to carry produce and to take care of that and provide those fresh options because there's so much waste. And it's it's a real challenging for a store to do that. Even if they wanted to, it can be one of the harder things of owning a grocery store. What what do you do? I mean, a lot of a lot of places would uh, make sure that they go to the food bank or someplace where they can be used. Oh, you mean the for waste. the waste? Yeah. Yes, you do do that. But I mean, in terms of like being able to afford it as a business, mm. you really have to have that commitment to doing that in neighborhoods. And it that makes any any business in grocery that's a challenge. Yeah. Mm. Any slim margins you want, you want to maximize those costs on your purchasing, and you want to maximize your shrinking. Mm-hmm. But I, I would like that down to comment on your, your caller. It's kind of the chicken and egg theory of development: who comes first, the the businesses or the residents? But really, is, it is the residents. You've got to have those. As I said earlier, you've got to have those risk takers go in and start to repopulate mm-hmm. those areas, and they got to make them safe, and they got to make them conducive. And then the mom and pop shops like us have to be able to turn a profit. I mean, we are a for-profit business, so we have to be able to profit. And then once we do that, then you can recruit your friends to come in there and it keeps going. But I, I give kudos to your caller that mm-hmm. it's those type of folks that are taking that risk and doing these type of ventures on the rooftops that will make that neighborhood come. They just got to wait. It's, they mm-hmm. got to get more people and we got And then we can, you know, make a profit by going there, right? You call yourself a mom and pop shop? Well, I am a pop. I have four <laughs> daughters. <laughs> well, yeah, no. So, I mean, uh, you know, everybody's got a different path into, into business. Mine was an extension of the development of Lafayette Square area. I mean, as you all know here, that was a very blighted area for decades mm-hmm. and seen a wonderful resurgence. But we were experiencing the same problem. And my wife and I raised all our four daughters there was that we received people come, but then they were leaving because they didn't have a lot of the amenities. Mm-hmm. So you bring those amenities, those mom and pop shops. And I do consider myself a mom and pop shop. I'm a local guy just like Vince and Maddie. And then the next wave comes and mm-hmm. then they come. And then I, I have visions and of hopefully not being a mom and pop shop or being larger, but uh, right now I currently am. Yeah. Uh, if we'll concede that this market today is in a state of flux, a lot of stuff going on in the market today, people trying to figure things out. Vincent, I'll ask you and ask everyone, what, what are the biggest challenges you're facing today? Well, <clears throat> biggest challenges is to retain your customers and your base and to make a profit, like, like Chris says, and, uh, you know, that, like with your employees you have are very important. And I think I've got a very good group of employees that that really communicate with the customers. And and like I said earlier, that know the children and and, uh, and their history and everything. And they just like, well, years ago when you used to talk to a neighbor next, in the backyard across the fence. Yeah. How many employees do you have? I've got about 14 uh, Maddie, your challenges? I would say they're very similar to what he (laughs) mentioned. Um, You know, retaining and growing your customer base and letting people know you're there. Uh, We don't have like a giant marketing budget to to reach out. So that's, you have to do it a little more organically, if you will. Um, Making a profit also can be somewhat of a challenge, although our store is definitely on better footing and staying relevant and and making sure it's a place people want to come. We've got 30 seconds left, Chris. What do you? What's your big challenge today? A lot of the same things like that, I guess, but a little different perspective is that, you know, it takes three things to make a business work, a crazy entrepreneur. We've all covered that yeah. part of it. <laughs> uh, you've got to have good labor. That's the other third. And you've got to have investment capital. Mm-hmm. And those investors want to be paid back. That's the biggest challenge is convincing the investors that the city's on the right road. Now, they're tiptoeing in. They're coming back. But that's, that's the big challenge. All right. We'll leave it at that. Uh, good luck to all of you. Thank you so much for Thanks being for with us. us. This fun. That would be Vincent Romatka, Vincent's Market, Maddie Ernest, the co-owner of Local Harvest Grocery, uh, and Chris Goodson, the owner of Fields Foods. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.